For the recent 50th anniversary of Doctor Who, we'll consider the question of the Doctor, the Daleks, and what to do about them on this episode of The Sci-Fi Show. I've enjoyed Doctor Who since I was a kid growing up with Tom Baker, Peter Davidson and Sylvester McCoy. There's various regenerations of the Doctor, and I've been enthralled by the new series as well. The Doctor has many foes and has found himself locked in life and death struggle with them over the years. But his most implacable and deadly foes have been the Daleks and their chilling screech of exterminate. Time and again the Doctor has saved the universe from these mechanical menaces. The Daleks are genetically engineered creatures that are the products of the scientist Davros from the planet Scarrow. More than once, the Doctor has been confronted with the opportunity to rid the universe of the Daleks forever. Should the Doctor do this? This will be the first of a three-part series to look at this question, and how the three broad approaches to ethics, virtue ethics, deontological ethics, and consequentialist ethics, approach such a question. This time, we'll consider it from the perspective of virtue ethics. Before we get to the Doctor's choice, we'll need to determine what virtue ethics are. The basic conception of virtue ethics goes back, as so much in Western philosophy does, to the ancient Greeks, and specifically to the philosophers Socrates, Plato and Aristotle. There's also a strong virtue ethics tradition in Chinese and Indian philosophy. Virtue ethics is different to the other two ethical frameworks we'll look at because it doesn't concentrate on trying to construct a list of rules, but it's more interested in the soul and character of the person who's called to an ethical life. What matters in virtue ethics is that a person cultivate a virtuous character, and the virtuous person will know how to act in an ethical way in a given situation. There are three basic concepts that lie at the heart of virtue ethics, arete, phrenesis, and our old friend eudaimonia. Ariti is a word that means excellence and carries with it the idea of being the best person you can be. In this context, it carries with it the idea of moral excellence and being virtuous, not simply a skilled athlete or the like. Phrenesis is a word that means practical wisdom and is distinguished from the other Greek word Sophia, which is usually translated as wisdom, but Sophia generally denotes theoretical wisdom. Phrenesis concerns itself with the ability to make practical everyday choices, and in a virtue ethics concerns itself with the ability to reason morally and apply what Aristotle termed the first principles of practical reason and the Stoics called the natural law. We'll return to the idea of natural law in a future episode. Finally, we come back to eudaimonia. If you remember from the episode about the good life, eudaimonia is a word that is translated happiness or blessedness and it's in this context, carries with it meanings that include human flourishing. Virtue ethics is inevitably a teleological moral enterprise. There are proper ends for human life, and ways for a life to be well lived or a life wasted. This stands in contrast to modern notions of happiness that see it as just a subjective emotional state. Each of the different virtue ethics traditions has a slightly different list of what are the virtues that should be cultivated. And I'll look at the Greek version of such a list, but you'll be able to find links in the show notes to the Eastern varieties, and we'll have a look at those in a future episode. Before we get to a list of the virtues, we need to touch on an important idea from Aristotle. He called it the golden mean, and it refers to the idea that all virtues are a midpoint between two vices. That it was possible to fail to be virtuous in two different ways, either by an excess or a deficiency of the trait. The virtuous person will sit on the mean between the two vices. A simple example is courage. There are two mistakes that can be made when it comes to courage. The first is familiar, and it's cowardice. The coward runs when they should stay and fight. But there's an opposite error that a person can fall into, and that is rashness. The rash man will run headlong into danger, even when it achieves no good end. The courageous man is the one who knows when to stay and fight, and when it is right to withdraw, to live to fight another day. When to make that decision in any particular circumstance varies, and this is where phrenesis comes in. The idea of the golden mean applies to all the classical Greek virtues. The ancient Greek philosopher Plato 
identified what is known as the four cardinal virtues. Prudence, justice, temperance, and courage. His student Aristotle identified a further collection of minor virtues in addition to Plato's cardinal virtues. Some of Aristotle's minor virtues include anger, shame, self-expression, honour, both receiving and giving, conversation, and confidence. We could add the modern virtue of tolerance to this list as well, although the modern idea of tolerance as the only good, and tolerating pretty much anything as a good, would seem to be slipping from the golden mean. The early Christian church adopted Plato's virtues and gave them the name the cardinal virtues, and added three theological virtues to the list in the form of faith, hope, and charity. The church theologian and philosopher Augustine of Hippo said that unlike the four cardinal virtues, there was no golden mean of the theological virtues. Provided you understand charity correctly, which in this context means rightly ordered, disinterested love for the other people, then I think this is probably true. So how does a person acquire virtue? Plato, in his dialogue The Meno, lists four possible approaches to acquiring virtue. Although all of them are listed by the ancient Plato, it seems that of the four ways, two are steadfastly ancient approaches and two are more modern approaches. The four possible ways to be virtuous are by nature, by instruction, by habit, and against nature. The two modern approaches are the first and the last. The first is the claim that humans are basically good and if left unmolested, will live virtuous lives. It's commonly described in the idea of the noble savage. The men will be good and virtuous, but our upbringing and civilization spoils us. This was an idea made popular by the French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. I have to wonder if he reconsidered his position towards the end of his life as he lost his head in the guillotine during the terror that followed on the heels of the French Revolution after he fell out of favour with the Jacobins. The fourth option, against nature, is an idea we find in Machiavelli and Hobbes. That man left to his own devices is not a noble savage, but a little barbarian that needs to have civilization beaten into him. That being virtuous runs counter to man's nature. You find this idea underlying Hobbes's idea in the Leviathan. That man, if not made virtuous against his nature, can expect life to be nasty, brutish and short, in Hobbes's memorable words. <laughs> Finally, we have two similar but distinct ideas favoured by Plato and Aristotle. Plato thought that virtue was something that was taught, that if you instructed people on how to live virtuous lives, then knowing the right course of action, they would undertake it. Virtue was primarily taught by instruction in, in school and by family. Aristotle disagreed with Plato. Although he agreed that virtue needed to be taught, he thought that was insufficient and that virtue also needed to be built up by habit that learning the right choice was not enough. It also needed to be practiced and become ingrained as the right way to act. I think Aristotle had it right, that man is capable of being virtuous, that it's in line with his nature, but that there's a competing nature that seeks to pull us into the other direction as well. This idea is summed up in the Judeo-Christian story of the fall of man, that we were once virtuous, as Rousseau thought, but that we fell and now have a competing nature that is of the sort Machiavelli and Hobbes recognised. How typical of the ancients to find the midpoint between the two. So where does all this leave us with the Doctor? Although the Doctor never quite manages to wipe out the Daleks entirely, he has had opportunity to do what he believed would wipe them out. The question is, should the virtuous man do it? In the fourth Doctor story, Genesis of the Daleks, the Doctor is sent by the Time Lords of Gallifrey to wipe out the Daleks at the time of their creation, because the Time Lords have seen a point in the future when the Daleks have conquered the entire universe. The Ninth Doctor confronts what he believes to be the last surviving Dalek of the Time War, and the Tenth Doctor faces a similar situation in the Crucible, when he can again wipe out the Daleks and rid the universe of them forever. Should the Doctor do it? Should he take the opportunity to rid the universe of the Daleks forever? The question is complicated by his knowledge that, as one of his incarnations observes, the existence of the Daleks will make for many bad things, many tragedies, but it will also allow for great good and cooperation as species are united in the struggle against the Daleks. The choice is not a simple one, but then again, it is probably for the best that we struggle with the idea of committing genocide. So what would be the virtuous choice for the Doctor to make? One time when the Doctor is confronted with the choice, Davros, the seemingly indestructible crippled creator of the Daleks, challenges the Doctor when he's trying to work out what the best course of action is. Davros tells the Doctor that to flip a switch and destroy the Daleks, to commit the genocide, 
would mean the Doctor is no better than the Daleks and their genocidal ambition to be the superior life form in the universe. In a disturbing comment on human nature, the decision is removed from the Doctor when the half-human regenerated hand of the Doctor, a hybrid Time Lord human, that looks like the Doctor, but with only one heart, flips the switch and destroys the Daleks without hesitation. So how should the Doctor decide? How would you decide? Would the virtuous man choose to annihilate the Daleks given opportunity? You can find more information on the different ideas contained in this episode in the show notes on scifishow.com. And if you've never seen Doctor Who, you can find links to purchase it from Amazon in the show notes. I can be reached with comments via feedback at scifishow.com, and you can leave a comment in the show notes at scifishow.com, and you can also leave a comment on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash scifishow. You can also follow the show via The Sci-Fi Show on Twitter. If there's a topic you'd like me to look into, please don't hesitate to ask. And don't forget, it's Fi with a PH. Let me know what you think. Sci-Fi Show is recorded under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license, and the music is by Furious J and Maniacal M. Mm-hmm.